Well, I'm about to tell you one of the most profound near-death experience stories maybe your viewers have ever heard. These angels have so much knowledge and wisdom, and they're pouring wisdom into me like I've never experienced anything like this in my life. This wisdom is growing within me. They show me the past, they show me the present, and they show me the future. They teach me nine principles of enlightenment. Your viewers have to learn these principles because these principles will keep them on the right road of enlightenment, which will keep them on the path and will be part of God's love. Kindness and forgiveness is probably the two most important thing I say in God's eye. Our physical spirit grows in a sequence of choices we make throughout our lifetime till we hit a plateau of love. The plateau we're all looking for is love. Hello, my name is Bill Tortorella. I had a near-death experience in 1994 in Tucson, Arizona. I have a, a book named The Ninth Level of Enlightenment, The Wisdom of the Light. So I opened my own business, and uh, that business took me all over the world. And that's how I wound up getting to Tucson, Arizona, because I was doing a gem show out there, gem and jewelry show. And people actually from all over the world come. So, but this this time, the you know, the cold and flu season is in and people are coughing here and there. And I'm noticing this a lot during the first couple of days. It was on the third day of the show, we were working and doing very good because it's a very busy show. Lady across from me in the booth just collapses to the floor. I'm in my early 40s now. I'm 42 years old. I jump up right away and and go to her aid because I the old paramedic skills kick in every time I see somebody in trouble. I mean, I'm still that way today. My my wife thinks I'm a little crazy there, but I'll get up and go. When somebody falls down somewhere, I'll go and try and see what I could do. So basically she fell. I and I couldn't see her. So I went around the booth and went inside. She's on the floor and I just pick her up. I try to pick her up a little bit. And I felt the heat coming out of her body. I don't know what her temperature was, but it was it was terribly high. She's already been coughing for two or three days there. So I'm fine all up until this time. Wait till the paramedics come. I just wanted to make sure her airway was good. She was breathing properly because that's all I could do at the time. So I got back to the hotel. I wasn't too bad at first, but as, as the night progressed, it started to get to 9, 10 o'clock. I started feeling worse and worse. The fever was going up again. I took a couple of hits with the inhaler, and then I remember taking the antibiotic, and I must have fell off to sleep. Well, I'm about to tell you one of the most profound near-death experience stories maybe your viewers have ever heard. I fell off to sleep. I physically remember how I left my body. You know, they say the eyes are the windows of the soul, and I believe that's the way we come in and the way we leave. Because I physically saw myself leaving my body in this beautiful mist, fluorescent. It was the color of life. It was so magnificent. So I am that color and I'm inside this beautiful flowing mist floating above my body. Nowadays, they talk about the penal gland. Well, I knew nothing about that. I didn't know it could have been that because it was coming to the same area. But I knew nothing about the penal gland whatsoever. I'm floating above the body and I'm feeling free. I'm feeling this freedom and I'm starting to feel some kind of love that I've never felt in my life. I mean, I'm feeling wonderful and I'm looking down at my body. At this moment, I still recognize my body. Soon as I remember saying physically out loud, that body is not alive. Or that body is dead. I forgot how I put it exactly. As soon as I said that, this beam of light from behind came from behind me, lit everything up. It was all just bright now and turned me. And this beautiful, I I turned and I didn't turn. It turned me. I turned and it drew me into this beautiful gateway, this beautiful tunnel. And the tunnel was made up of magnificent colors. And I was moving as it's going along. And now I'm starting to move faster and faster. You could see the speed. You can't feel it. 
but I'm moving faster and faster. And I see these beautiful lights and whizzing and colors moving by me and through me. And all I feel is love and totally protected. I'm totally got, like, I feel like I'm being cradled. I'm being protected by something or someone. And the love is increasing now. I mean, this love is so wonderful and so beautiful. It, you feel it like build within your soul. And I'll never forget my, my arrival because this was this part was unbelievable. When I arrive in heaven, because I believe in God, I arrive in heaven, I say, I'm home. Thank God I'm home. And I was so joyous. And there was other spirits there. There were spirits all around me. And I was just like in amazement, in amazement. And all of a sudden, I hear another voice for the first time. I hear a soft whisper in my ear saying, yes, Bill, you're home in the light of God. I was, I talk today and the hair on my arm stand up about that. Because I'll never forget that feeling. That feeling, even though I was in spiritual form, I felt like I was in body form. I felt tears. I felt things like that. I felt, I felt the love like you can't imagine here. There's no imagining it. It's impossible because it's it's thousands of times greater than what we could conceive here. And she said to me, I'm one of your three guardians. I was with you on your way home. I said, I didn't realize you, you were with me. I remember speaking with her, but of course, we're, we're using telepathy. There's, there's no mouths at this time. There's no bodies. She's a beautiful beam of light, and I'm still a floating mist. And but we're having a communication that's unbelievable. I think on the other side we use almost a hundred percent of our mind. When on this side, when on this this plane that we're on, I'm not going to see say we're dumb people, but I think we only use about six percent or seven percent of our mind. And I think some of the greatest minds in the world can only use about nine percent of their mind. But on the other side, you feel everything. You converse with family and friends. In that, in that same illuminated area. And I knew they were my family. And not only did you converse with, you converse with everyone at the same time, like you're, you're almost like you're all one, but you're understanding different thoughts and different, you're getting these, these things in your mind, I'm gonna say, okay? You're getting actual thoughts from people. You're feeling love. You're feeling attention. You're feeling like you're embraced. It, it's magnificent. And Antonia said that she was one of my three guardians, right? She said, I had two other guardians. And all of a sudden, this light starts to approach me. And now I'm sort of standing alone with Antonia on my side. And this light, this beam, I'm starting to feel... I said, the love never stops growing on, the, on that side. Um, he said, hello, Billy. And as soon as he said, hello, Billy, I knew that was my brother's voice. My brother Peter died when I was at 15 or six, 16 years old, I was. So we're talking, I haven't seen Peter now in 26 years. And now... It's a Peter, it's, and the embrace was so beautiful. It's like we came together in an embrace. It, it was wonderful. And that feeling was great for a minute or two, I would say. And then he says, we have to leave now. I have to wear. I said, why? I didn't know what was going on. I knew that I was in full spirit. At this point, I have to bring this up because it's very important. I didn't remember myself here. I had no memory whatsoever of here. All I did remember is that was home, and these were my family and friends, and this is my brother. So now I'm at this point. He says, we have to go for your life review. Well, I've, I had no idea what that was. So, and we just whisked off. Again, there was no control, me having any physical control there. They had complete control over me. And he brought me to this beautiful, illuminated area. And now they're starting to show me things in my life when I was a little boy. I mean, it was amazing. 
they're showing me with my friends at Coney Island. We had Brooklyn, we had a big amusement park right on the beach, uh, right in Coney Island in Brooklyn. It was, it was fantastic growing up. So my friends and I used to go there all the time. And my mom, you know, she did all right. My dad did all right. And we weren't rich by any means, but we were comfortable and she would give me some money. And now I, I have some money in my pocket. So I'm taking everybody with me, you know, cause a lot of my friends couldn't afford it. So we went down, we, we did the rides, everything had, a, you know, fantastic times with them. And it showed me all things I did through high school. Like it showed me the time where, you know, we had right before I graduated art and design, it showed me the time where we had to do a um, storyboard concept for, you know, like when they make a movie or a film years ago or a commercial, they used to do storyboards. They show me this, this beautiful thing when I, when I, I won this on Jesus Christ. Okay. So I do the whole story of his life from his earth all the way to his crucifixion on different panels. And I happened to, you know, win a nice little award for it. So that was wonderful. So all this, it, it's showing me good things after good things. So it takes me one more good thing that's very important. When I came down to Florida and I switched my career and I went and became a paramedic, it showed me this call we had. And we went downtown Miami to pick up our, our unit. Every time we had to go to the main station to pick up our unit and drive it up to our station in North Miami Beach. My partner and I gets there early as usual. We get our coffee, we hop in the unit, and we're driving up 95 just to go to our station. But well, we're on 95, I-95 and about 95th Street. And all of a sudden, a call comes over the radio. There's a 317. And anything with a three in front of it means it's an emergency. So when I say 317, it meant car accident or truck accident, a motorcycle accident, something that happened on the highway. But then they say, the, you know, they announce where it is. They say it's on I-95 and 135th Street. And by this time, by the time they get that out, I'm probably on 110th, 115th Street already. I picked up the microphone and said, we have an ETA of less than one or two minutes. I'll never forget this. There's a kid running around frantically. And I see him bleeding a little bit. And, and I go get the bag. And we're running towards him, me and my partner, Danny. And... As soon as we get by him, he turns around and he says, my sister, my sister, like this. He's pointing to his sister, and we both turn at the same time. I'll never forget this scene. Her physical head is through the window, and we immediately got right on it. We had to assess. We had less than maybe 15 seconds to assess it. We said to ourselves, we said out loud, I mean, do we say wait for the fire truck to come with the cutters? Because they used to have these cutters that cut through metal and glass and everything. But the glass is now embedded all the way back to here. I look at her, and she's still breathing inside the car. So I hop outside the car. I said to Danny, we got to get her off. They'll never get here in time. She'll bleed out. So I, I help well, slightly, very, very easing, you know, putting her head through to Danny inside. And then he, he's got her inside on his lap. He's holding her head. And then he hands it over to me. We put her on the stretcher. Because I pull her out and I grab her underneath and I have the top on my head and I and he's on the bottom of her. And we pull her out of the car and put her right on the stretcher. Now we're running right over to the ambulance. I'm trying to wrap a bandage around her and everything is happening so quick. We get to only about two miles from Parkway General Hospital. I'm holding her head. I got him, her neck braced on me, but her body starts to seize. Now, we didn't have much time to do anything because I was just bracing her with my body, with my foot up against the the other, um, the long chair on the side of the unit. So I was braced pretty strong where, you know, nothing, she can't fall off. But her whole body starts to jump up in the air from the seizure. And now I can't control it, her, her head. I mean, and I can't control her feet at the same time. So I turn around and her brother was in the back with me. And the, the poor young man, he was crying his eyes out, looking out the back window. I yelled, God, help me. And I'm looking at him meaning for him to come and help me. And in my life review, I saw Peter's hand come right on her head. I saw Peter's hand come down along with mine. It was the most beautiful thing because now I'm physically seeing Peter in my life review. You know, we're, we're in spirit form now watch, doing this. But his hand is right on her head. And it, it's, it's, it's magnificent. We get there. They rush her off to operating. Danny and I took off, but, you know, she lost so much, so much blood. 
and we needed to change our, our uniforms. We got down to our station. We changed our uniforms. We had a 24-hour shift. So real quick, the day was pretty busy. The night wasn't too busy. We had a couple of calls. I'm waking Danny up about an hour before we got to return the unit. And he doesn't know what time it is. So I just wake him up and he thinks it's time to go. So he putting his shoes on and everything. And I said, Danny, we got to go back to the parkway. And he looked at me like I had two heads. He said, Billy, she's dead. She's dead. And I said, I said, Danny, I got to go back to Parkway. I feel something. I never asked in the years that I was to do this with anybody. But I said, there was something I had to go back. He finally agreed with me after not a confrontation, but because we were going six, seven miles out of our way that way. And then six, seven miles south. He was worried about being late. I said, I didn't tell you I woke you up an hour early. So we, he wouldn't be late. Anyway, so we get to the hospital and we know, I know all the nurses on the shifts because we're in and out all day long. And I believe it was a nurse by the name of Becky. And I said, what happened to that young girl that we brought in yesterday? And when she looked at me like this and she says, do you want to meet her? I got, again, the chills. To stay, it's the same thing now. The chills stand up on my arms, my hair, you know, it's it's incredible. She brings us up to the room and she's sitting up in bed eating jello. And she's got this big turban on her head wrapped around, but not on her face. I look at her face because I couldn't see her face because it was covered, you know, covered with blood. But she only had little minute scratches on her face. I looked at her and said, thank God. And thank God she's awake and she's up and she's living. You know, I was so, I was so thrilled. It was so beautiful. Her brother wakes up out of a chair, he's sleeping in the corner, jumps up and points, this is the man that saved your life. And then we just had a beautiful embrace. It was, it was magnificent. And that's what Life Review is. They show you the things you've done in your life. And then it turns on me. And now they start showing me the bad side or the wrong side. And this wasn't as pleasing. So... Again, it starts out when I was a little kid, you know, a little kid getting a little trouble. You have little fights and things like that. And I'm very fortunate, I believe, because I feel like I really never did anything that, that bad. You know, I did crazy things like every teenager does, you know. But I don't feel like I did anything that cruel or that bad. I didn't think I did anything. But then it told me, you know, all the things during my young teens and little things like that. And then it takes me to the time when I was married to my first wife. And uh, we had a two-year-old son. And I call those years, you know, I was still young, you know, uh, not matured enough yet. I guess inside I felt like I never lived life on my own. So I wanted a, a divorce. and But, you know, when you do that, you're selfish. I was selfish at that time. I only was thinking about myself. I didn't know. I had no idea the pain that I caused. I caused this pain, and now I am physically becoming the pain in my near-death experience. I feel the pain inside like you could never imagine. I feel tears rolling down my cheeks. It's, it's terrible. I mean, it's getting worse and worse, but it's, it's actually feeling so intense that I've never had a feeling of pain like this emotionally. It was so bad. I remember them showing me a couple of things right after that, and then I started screaming, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I remember saying that completely out loud. And as I said that, all this grayness just dropped and we were sitting back in spirit form again. And now it's Antonia and Peter there. And they're these beautiful glowing beings. And Antonia turns to me and she says, Bill, she says, look at yourself. And I remember looking down at myself because you could even feel looking down. But you're no body. I'm looking down and I'm this beam of beautiful, green, magnificent, glowing beam of light. I'm just like them. I'm, I'm ecstatic. 
I'm feeling wonderful. I'm feeling light. Now I'm back in spirit. Now, you, there's only two times in the near death experience that I actually saw myself in my, in my life. And that was, that was in my life review. And then one more thing, the next thing I show. Antonia and Petey announce Orin is coming. So I look up in that direction, and now I see this magnificent angel coming at me, a spirit. At this moment, I couldn't tell the difference between angels and spirit. They were so also beautiful. But I felt wisdom that was so far beyond what I could fathom. It was unbelievable. But this wisdom was within me my whole life. That's why I say in that first part, you know, people want to hear about the near-death experience, but this wisdom, this Oren was my intuition, and he has been with me my whole life. I always explain Oren as the, the angel on my shoulder that whispers in my ear, the one that tells you that's not the right thing to do. Don't do it. Don't do it. Whenever you're hearing that, you must heed to the that warning, because that's a warning from the other side. It's very important that people understand that, know that. When they get that kind of intuition to pay attention to it, you know, we might like, want to do things that are not the right thing. And we veer off a lot of times in our lifetime, but we have to be brought back by the right path by listening to our wisdom, because our wisdom will only give us knowledge from the other side, and it keeps us right on our life path. It keeps us on our journey. We're showing our journey before we come. We know what body we're coming into. We know what mother we have. We know what father we have. We know these things prior to coming. Oren says, one more level, Bill. I remember they whisked me off. The, we all whisk off together. And now they bring me to this beautiful, beautiful crystal theater. It's, it's magnificent. It's all crystals reflecting the universe, and it's showing combustion and like almost like exploding, you know, stars like nebulas and things like that. But everything's reflecting off these beautiful crystals, and we're all part of this. And it was basically magnificent. But then they start the screen, I call it, and it felt like a flickering screen. They show me the past. They show me the present. And they show me the future. And they're showing me things now. They start showing me wars I was never in. I mean, I was physically never in those wars. It was World War II. But now I have to ask a question to myself. Was I in those wars? See, that part I don't know. It might have been me seeing that. Because every event that was any of importance, it stopped that. And it physically showed me those wars. Now, it's bringing me to my birth. I physically see my birth. And this is an all life review in the Hall of Events. Now, the Hall of Events, people know that as Akasha Records today. I didn't know when I was writing my books. Some of my books were written 20 years ago. I called it the Hall of Events, so I kept it that way. I learned about Akasha Records a long time ago. You might have heard that term. Uh, but the, I knew it only as the Hall of Events because that's how I saw it. And I had no idea what the near-death experience was because I was just a business person when this happened to me. So they take me past my birth, and they take, and it's moving and moving again. We're moving fast, and this whatever you want to call it, a computer screen or whatever, and it stops in the year, and it's 1963. And I'm sitting in my classroom. I'll never forget this. There's a speaker on the wall. The principal comes over the speaker, and he says that John F. Kennedy was just shot in Dallas, Texas. That, well, that was our president at the time, and he was loved. He was loved by lots of people. And I'll tell you, that day I got home, my mother, for some reason, wasn't at the bar because she used to have to go in real early because she was the cook. She was cooking early in the morning. And she's sitting at the kitchen table with Christine, the lady that helped bring me up. Her and Christine are at the table. They're crying their eyes out. And I say, I know, Mom, you know, John F. Kennedy just got shot. 
But now we're moving again. We're moving in time. And I physically see my near-death experience. So we're moving faster and faster, and I'm seeing all events leading up to my birth. But before that, I see major events. I see the Vietnam War ending. I remember the helicopters landing. We stopped at that event on the roof, the helicopter landing on the roof. I remember Martin Luther King. I remember Bobby. Then I remember Bob. I remember not my birth, my near-death experience in 1994. And I rewatched myself again, die on the bed. I physically watch myself die on the bed. And then we're moving faster again at speeds that are unbelievable. Like I said, it was like a flickering computer screen, and then it would just stop, and we were all there. We were physically in the scene while it was happening. Now it takes me up to what I know now is 9-11. At that physical time, I didn't know it was 9-11. I thought it might have been. I had a good feeling it was. Because I remember saying, to, I come from Brooklyn, New York, and Manhattan's right across the bridge. And that's where the Twin Towers were. And I remember saying, in all the debris, as it was falling around us, we're at the base of one of the towers, and this debris is just falling, falling, and there's little fires and burning, and it was horribly black smoke. You couldn't see through people. Were, people were running. And I remember running towards, I said, my friends, my friends, I'll never forget that. I said, my friends, my friends, and they reach out and grab me because now we're in, we're in physical, but we're, we're still spiritual, but we're in physical form. So when you get grabbed, you feel like you're getting grabbed. They reach out and grab me and said, Bill, you can't do anything. I said, but my friends are in the building. And basically, I think those paramedic skills always kicked in my whole life. They still kick in till today. I think that was just an instinct. And then when they told me I can't do anything, I said, why? I didn't know. They said, this is not happening. This is the future. At that point, I was really a little confused. I didn't understand what they meant by that. It was the future. After 9-11, moving again, we're in this computer screen again, flickering, 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 it stopped, and then it stops. What I believe today was Baghdad, because I remember the bombs going off, and we're in the center of the town of the city there, and there's physical bombs going off all around. People are running. And the way I recognized, I recognized when in Baghdad was way, because of the way the people were dressed. You know, I recognized it that way. And... From there, again, I started to run at one moment because I was just running from the bombs at this time. Physically, I thought I was going to get hurt because I was in the body. But as I said, you can't, this won't hurt you, though. And then they take me to a time that I believe is today. And this time today is so, so important because we're, the world is at a crossroads. We're in an ascension time frame. So I don't know if something's separating or what, but we're at a crossroads. People have to make choices. There's things I learned on the other side that's so important, and I'm going to bring up in the last thing right now, things about kindness, things about forgiveness, things about service. These things are so important that people physically start to do this and pay attention to what their life path is and not veer that much for whatever their motives are. This part is insane because now they show me a place that's so, so horrible. It's so drastic. I explain it um, when people ask me, like it was the movie Mad Max and the people of physically living off others and they don't mind hurting, killing. They'll do anything for a jug of water. I mean, anything for a scrap of food. It was so, so, so bad. And it was, it was big. It wasn't small. I knew it was on a big scale, even though we were in one area. But it was a big, big scale. So I don't know how this happened. I don't know what made this cut to this point. But it was a physically as bad 
as that movie, if people could remember. Then, I'm seeing different plateaus. And it was, it's so advanced. Everything on the other side is so advanced. It's so amazing. But the two levels they took me to was one that looked like Mad Max, and then the other side was a beautiful utopia. I believe in my heart where we're going, where we're going. I think all people with good heart and love within them are going to this utopia. I know when people feel God of the universe inside them on earth, this is what they want us to feel. That's why they send us lessons every day. Very rarely do people pay attention to their lessons, but it's very important that we pay attention to our lessons, our intuition. They come through our intuition of things to do. So all these things run in this kind of sequence. But this utopia is so wonderful. I mean, people, are, people live helping, caring, serving. They live as, as much for themselves as for others. They're kind. They forgive. Kindness and forgiveness is probably the two most important things I say in God's eye. I believe in God. I believe he created the universe. I believe the universe is the light. The light is God. The light is God. You physically get all the wisdom and knowledge from that light. So that light is within us. We all have a piece of that light inside us right now. That's what I learned. So the whole of events is finished. They show me the two outcomes. They take me in front of this panel now. Now, these are complete angels on this side. I know they're angels and not spirits because these are so bright. They're all magnificent white angels. They're huge. White in the spectrum is all the colors in the world together as one. And these angels have so much knowledge and wisdom, and they're pouring wisdom into me like I've never experienced anything like this in my life. This wisdom is growing within me. They teach me nine principles of enlightenment. The first principle is very important. You cannot take another life. You're not allowed to interfere with anyone else's life path. Now, it's important that you understand why. It's not that it's only wrong, and it's the, probably one of the worst things we could possibly do. But the reasoning that I got from the other side was that you will never know what this person's great-grandson or daughter could have achieved. They might have achieved the real cure for cancer. You know, things like that. I mean, it was on that plateau, that kind of energy field that I was learning all this on. And so that was wonderful. The second was your choice of your intuition. Your intuition is so important. Remember I told you Oren was my intuition. I've been telling you some of the principles along the way going here. But we all have an intuition. Did you ever have deja vu? I ask this to everybody. Do they have deja vu? And they all say yes. Everybody has deja vu. The reason why we have deja vu, because we previewed our life before we came in. We recognize places, things, people that we'd never been. We'd never been there before. I remember growing up. I remember when I was seven or eight years old, we used to hop in the train and just go different places, me and my friends, because we could do that when we were kids. Nowadays, you can't do that. Getting back to the, the intuition part is orange. The one that sits on my shoulder, everybody has an Oren. Might not be called Oren, might be called something else, you. When everybody gets there, they'll recognize their intuition as one of the most important things we could possibly have because it's our intuition that keeps us on a road of choices throughout our life. And this is how our physical spirit grows. Our physical spirit grows in a sequence of choices we make throughout our lifetime till we hit a plateau of love. The plateau we're all looking for is love. So 
to understand how we have to live in our lifetime is to try to become love. On the other side, you are love, so you don't have to try to become love. On this side, it's hard because there's a lot of filters in between everything. And it's, uh, it's impossible to feel that love that you feel on the other side here. But the way we experience and feel love here is through our love, through service and kindness of wisdom and forgiveness, all these things are so important for your soul. Like I said, the spirit grows through a process of this learning. We have this learning through our whole life. And at some point, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in God. But I also believe in incarnation. I know I was here before. I know Oren was 15,000 years. His spirit was so old and so knowledgeable and so much wisdom that you you can't imagine to, to, to be in that presence was something of you you were part that's what you do you feel them on the other side so that part is just beautiful and I'll tell you one more that's very important the, the earth the earth itself she has a spirit mother earth is alive Without Mother Earth, we can't, we don't live. Her rivers, are her, it's her veins. That's where we get our spring water from. Her trees are our oxygen. We can't live without Mother Earth. Mother Earth needs us. So it's a balance. When the Earth is in an imbalance is when we have things happen on the Earth that are not too good. The nine principles are so important to learn. Your viewers have to learn these principles because these principles will keep them on the right road of enlightenment, which will keep them on the path and will be part of God's love. That's what we want in the end. That's where we want to be at, okay? Another beautiful angel comes right up to me and he shows me this number sequence. That is so magnificent. Crystal numbers are flowing straight down in front of me in rows of crystal numbers and numbers. These particular numbers with light and light and light. We would get numbers like the ones with light, the eights with light, the threes, the sixes, the nines with light. These numbers, at the time, I thought they must have been significant because they would be bright right in front of me. Not stop, but be bright. The only ones that were bright were these numbers. The other ones would just keep flowing by and symbols. Like they explained it to me. They showed me how those numbers, they make our earth live. Without these specific numbers, we wouldn't have our seasons. We wouldn't have our tides. And they explained the one to me as God, being of God. They explained the eight to me as eternity. So that meant God from eternity. The one, the eight, together is nine. Nine is the highest number in the universe. These are things I'm getting explained over there, and I don't understand much of it, but what they're telling me. But it's sinking in. Now, this one was important because I remember this one my whole life. They gave me my alert number was 66. The number 66 was going to be important to me for very important things that happened in my life. They could be good or they could be bad. It was sort of a, like an alert of something to come. I would look down sometimes while I was driving. I'd be at exit 66. The same time I look at 66, I look down at my speedometer. I'm going 66. I turn up and look at my watch at the time, and it's six past six. I would see these numbers in my life at times during my life, and then something would happen. So I knew these, that number, that particular number I knew in my life. Because that's been with me my whole life. Now, they show me the nine principles of enlightenment, right? I got the numbers from the angels. They show me the distances and how important they are for our earth to exist. The mother earth breathes. She breathes, she lives, and she feels. Okay, this is so important that people understand that part. A beautiful spirit approaches me. Young spirit. I feel young. Because in my spirit now, 
I'm feeling older with wisdom. She said, you have the nine principles of enlightenment. You must return. And I said, no, I, I'm not. I'm home. I'm part of light now. I'm part of God's light. I'm home. She said, do you understand the nine principles of enlightenment? I said, yes, I understand them clearly. She says, you must return. And this spirit was serious. Well, at the time, my wife was at home pregnant. She didn't come to this show with me, this particular show with me. She was at home pregnant. And she, you know, she usually came to the show every year with me. But now I was thinking, well, maybe that's because of that. Because I'm getting glimpses of my life again at the end here. You must return. Well, yeah, they're sending me back because my boy, I'm begging and pleading, but I'm still not thinking in the human form. I'm begging now, I'm pleading to stay. I don't want to go. Please don't send me back. I remember saying that over and over in my head. She finally says, Dad, you must return. I'm in back. I'm being pulled back through the vortex so fast and so uncomfortable. Nothing like going. Nothing like the feeling of love going. And then I remember being zapped in my body. And the only thing that moved in my body was my throat. The only thing that moved in my body was my throat. I had no idea how long I did not breathe for. Because I took a breath like you were underwater for six minutes. I mean, I took, I was like, <laughs> you know how you would breathe like that. I tried to get every amount of air in my lungs as possible. Then I did. And now I was able to breathe, but I couldn't move. My whole body didn't move. I had no feelings in my arms and legs. They were just sitting there, and I thought I was paralyzed. I had, believe me, now I'm in the pain with the body again. I'm racked still with all this misery I got, my throat being where I could barely breathe. And I'll never forget what must have been probably less than 10 minutes seemed like hours. I finally started getting tingles in my feet, my hands, and coming up to my arm, and I'm starting to feel my limbs again very slowly at first, but as soon as I got some kind of feeling, I reached over, I grabbed the phone. I grabbed the phone. I picked it up. I said, have someone come in and take me to the hospital. I don't know if they sent my friends in because I, I passed out again. I remember her saying to me before I left, I am six of six. Everything at that time went past me. But I got one part of this last, the end of the story. There's one important part. Now, my son was born that September of 1994. My son, Billy, was born. But years later, in the year 2000, on the sixth day of the sixth month, my beautiful daughter, Brianna, was born. And she was six of six. I believe that she was the spirit that sent me back. I believe that wholeheartedly because even when I talk about it today, again, I get the chills. 